evening and welcome to your bedtime story. My name is Betsy and I'm a children's librarian with Frederick County Public Libraries. Throughout the past week, we have been looking at some of the characters of our fairy tales and folk tales who are often the least liked. We've met the Wicked Witch, or not the Wicked Witch, excuse me, the Wicked Queen. <laughs> We met last night Ursula, the sea witch, and tonight we're going to meet, does anybody remember my trivia question from last night? Um, my trivia question from last night was that this um, beast has, or, whoop, <laughs> I told you it was. That's the thing when you go, when you have a live video. So my uh, trivia question last night was, the villain has to keep his eye on a rose. And of course, um, if, if you remember the Disney animated movie, Beauty and the Beast, it was the beast who had to keep his eye on the rose because he would stay a beast forever. Yep, Chris says the beast. Um, you, he would stay a beast forever if that last petal fell to the ground before he found true love or before he fell in love. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the original Beauty and the Beast folktale. Um, was written actually, or it was published in 1740 in a book called The Young American and Marine Tales. And it was written by a French novelist. Her name was Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve. And it was a very lengthy version and it was tailored to adults. And so in 1756, it was republished by Jean-Marie Le Prince de Beaumont in a um, journal or like a magazine called Children's Collection. And so then it became popular with English speakers in 1889 when the Beaumont version was republished in a um, collection of fairy tales called The Blue Fairy Book. And that was published in 1889. And the story itself is not necessarily original to France, although she did write the story. She based the tale on some ancient Greek traditions, as well as an Italian fairy tale as well. Um, and so, like I said, the first version published was very lengthy, and then it was shortened for the second version for the children's book. And it contains very little... Um, relationship or significance with the Beauty and the Beast movie that many of us are so familiar with. Um, the story concerns a merchant who has a lot of children and he loses all of his money when his ships sink and he goes out to search for them and he gets lost and he comes back and he sees this castle. He eats at the castle and of course it's the Beast and um, he tells the um, merchant you know you can stay um or if you go home you have to send come back you have to send one of your beautiful daughters to stay in my place or in your place and then of course in the end um the what ends up happening is is that the bell um the main character at least in um the version that so many of us are familiar with begins to wish for home. And so the beast tells her she can go home, but she has to come back in two months. And when she gets home, her sisters are very jealous um, and they attempt to uh, kill her. And then they try to keep her from being able to go back. And of course there is this prince that also lives at the castle, but she can't tell. She doesn't know the prince is also the beast. And so it's a very different tale than from what we watched or what I certainly watched in the movie theater many years ago. And so the film uh, was 1991 was when Beauty and the Beast, the original animated musical um, was uh, presented, produced by the Walt Disney Feature Animations and Walt Disney Pictures. And it is part of what a time period called the Disney Renaissance. And it was when Disney returned to making feature full length animated films. Um, with the first one being The Little Mermaid, and then the second one being Rescuers Down Under, and then this is the third one, Beauty and the Beast. And it was a tale like we've heard um, yesterday uh, with The Little Mermaid. This was a tale that Walt Disney wanted to do from the very beginning. He loved the story, but 
it's a hard one to adapt without a lot of um, reworking. And so he considered doing it after Snow White. And then a French producer produced a French film in 1946 called Beauty and the Beast. And so Walt Disney shelved it and they brought it um, back again, back out in the late 80s. And um, they knew that uh, they had this great um, success with the Little Mermaid and so they wanted to kind of return to that tradition with this beautiful animation and of course lovely music um, and so the Beast um, himself the character of the Beast is in the movie it's kind of a morph of all these different animals like the head of a buffalo and the body of a bear and he has claws like a cat um, but there really is no um, description that I could find that shows where they got the idea for the beast from the original story. There's no description of what the beast looked like as to where they would have found that information. Now, the Beaumont story, they think they based the tale upon this man who suffered from hypotrichosis, and that is a disease where you grow hair on your face. It's kind of uncontrollable. And so there was a very famous French man who suffered from that disease, and they believe that the descriptions and kind of the idea came from this gentleman. He was very famous, like I said, and he was under the protection of the French king and queen. And he lived um, on an island off the coast of France, and he was kind of protected by them. Obviously, a lot of people saw him either as a danger or as something to kind of stare at and gawk at. And so they believe, um, modern day scholars believe that is kind of where the idea for the beast came from. Of course, in the Disney animated movie, it's made much more animal-like and less human. But the chapter that we read, you know, the books that we've been reading from are from a series by Serena Valentino called um, The Villain Series. And so this is The Beast Within, A Tale of Beauty's Prince. And it says, the tale is as old as time. A cruel prince is transformed into a beast. A lovely maiden comes into this monster's life. He is transformed by her compassion and the love he feels for her in return. The two live happily ever after. But any tale, especially one as storied as Beauty and the Beasts, has been told many different times and in many different ways. No matter which version one hears, the nagging question remains, what was it that transformed the prince into the beast that we are introduced to? This is one version pulled from the many passed down through the ages, a story of vanity and arrogance, of love and hatred, of beastliness, and of course, beauty. So let's read a little bit of chapter one, The Witches in the Rose Garden. The beast stood in his rose garden the overwhelming scent of new blossoms making him slightly dizzy. His garden always seemed to have a life of its own, as if the twisting thorny vines could wrap themselves around his racing heart and put an end to his anxiety. There were many times when he wished they would, but now his mind was filled with images of the beautiful young woman inside his castle. Belle, so brave and noble, willing to take her father's place as a prisoner in the castle dungeon. What sort of woman would do that? Give up her life so easily, sacrificing her freedom for her father's. The beast wondered if he was capable of such a sacrifice. He wondered if he was capable of love. He stood there looking at the view of his castle from the garden. He tried to recall how the castle had looked before the curse. It was different now, menacing and alive. Even the spires of his castle seemed to consciously pierce the sky with a violent fervor. He could only imagine how the place looked from a distance. It was tall and imposing and perched on the top of the highest mountain in the kingdom. And it appeared as though it were cut from the very mountain itself surrounded by a thick green forest 
filled with dangerous wild creatures. Only since he had been forced to spend his life hidden within its wretched walls and on its grounds had he done such things as take in his surroundings this way, actually see and indeed feel them. He now contemplated the moonlight casting sinister shadows on the statues that flanked the path leading from the castle to his garden. Large winged creatures more frightening than anything from the ancient stories the tutors of his youth had made him study. He couldn't recall these sculptures being there before the castle and its lands were enchanted. There had been many changes since the witches had brought their enchantments. The topiaries, for example, seemed to snarl at him as he prowled the labyrinth on evenings like this, attempting to take his mind off his troubles. He had long since gotten used to the statues, watching watchful eyes glancing at him when he wasn't looking at them directly, and their slight movements he caught only out of the corner of his eye. He couldn't escape the feeling of being watched and had almost gotten used to it almost, and the grand entrance of his castle seemed to him like a gaping mouth prepared to devour him. He spent as much time outdoors as possible. The castle felt like a prison, and as large as it was, it confined him, choking the life out of him. So that is a little bit of the first chapter of Serena Valentino's The Beast Within, A Tale of Beauty's Prince. So, um, yes, all of our fairy tales that we have been reading um, are part of our Explore, Invent, Transform Your Story, our summer challenge. And you can find more information about that at www.fcpl.org forward slash summer. So, we have one more story this week. We're going to do one more villain's tale tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. And I should give you another clue, right? Hi, Amelia. Welcome back. Um, so, all right, Amelia, let's let's think of a clue for tomorrow night's trivia. In this villain loves to brush her daughter's hair. All right, so that is the story we're going to read tomorrow night, the story of that villain. Again, this one is going to be very different from the tale that we read, um, that we'll read, of course, from the original fairy tale and folk tale. So which villain loves to brush her daughter's hair? All right, I'll see you all tomorrow night. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.